What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and we're diving into the hauntingly beautiful Corral by Nicholas Walker. Nick is one of my favorite people on the planet. I have been working on this piece for the past four years. So I was thrilled to see that String Virtuoso had added this piece to their impressive catalog of tutorials. So in this video, I'm going to play the piece, pick apart some weird stuff I'm doing, including this glance, and we'll go through the piece with Nick and learn lessons that you can apply to any piece of music. Thank you. 
All right, let's dive in, and I can't help but give myself a little critique here at the beginning of that performance. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I shaved two minutes off of that piece compared to what Nick plays. His performance goes about eight minutes long, mine was six, and he just enjoys the music more than it sounds like I'm enjoying it. I love the piece, but I've got this very caffeinated approach to it, so as I continue to work on this piece, I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. He just takes his time with the phrases, takes his time between the phrases. I'm basically playing some of this stuff in like 2-2 two, two, letter A um, versus in four, which is written. So that's the first thing, is I'm just a little fast. Second of all, the groove section, this uh, my wife pointed out, I played that recording, and I was like, hey, check out this, uh, this uh, the three camera thing that I did of, of Nick Walker's chorale. And she said, what is the meter of that section? And I realized I am playing it like in three, four. I am rushing the heck out of the first part of the bar, Nick, plays it <laughs> in time, unsurprisingly. And so uh, I don't know why I learned it that way or got that in my head, so I will work on that. And finally, this is more of a technical thing than anything, but that side glance that I give the camera, I'm doing that just because I'm so worried that I don't have the camera going. So as I do these recordings, I'm constantly looking at the cameras at the beginning just to make sure that that red light is going, like I'm doing right now, it is going. Okay, let's dig into Nick teaching this piece on the String Virtuoso site, and that is one of the things that I think is so cool about this approach is we can hear from him in this five-part tutorial going through on String Virtuoso. Hello, and thank you for your interest in playing chorale for solo bass. Hello, Mr. This Walker. This is a special piece for me because I wrote it for my mom. I know that you will bring it to life in your own unique way as well. Yeah, maybe not as fast the as me. and um, approaches that I share with you through this video are not meant to dampen your own unique way of playing the piece. A lot of this piece revolves around open strings, yep. harmonics. Nick has these really cool, um, I think that the Gensler strings, if there are any hardcore string nerds out there, feel free to correct me in the comments, uh, but there's this ringiness great terminology, Jason, but there's this like open, wild ringiness to Nick's bass. My bass, I have uh, Diderio Kaplan's on, which I love, but they have much more of a dampening quality, so that's part of why his sound just has this like forever ring to it. Like, go get a cup of coffee and come back and the bass is still ringing. My bass has a nice ring, but the sound dies a little bit faster. That is by design, and I. this is a great setup for me for like subbing in the San Francisco Symphony. But if I was just playing solo stuff, I might dig into these strings. They're pretty cool. And uh, yeah, the still connection ringing. between harmonics and closed notes, right? And there's also a bunch of um, ringing pizzicato harmonics. So for that reason, I like to focus on what some call the primary sound of the instrument. That's the sound that the instrument makes when it's ringing on its own. So. Interesting. Primary sound uh, might not have as much grit or density as what I would use in an ensemble. It's a little rounder and more uh, matching with the resonator. He has such a sophisticated approach to tone. Someday I gotta just get together with Nick and do a whole video on I tone can't with him. tell the difference between when I have the bow on the string and when I take the bow off the string. That's interesting. So he's like focused on that ring there. And again, his bass just rings for ages. Mine, because of the particular strings I'm using, it dies off much faster. Not totally, and there are strings that die off quicker than this, but that's kind of the idea. So um, I need to try those strings with this piece. So manage your weight, speed, and placement. Usually the placement's about one-seventh of the string length. To find a sound that's not too dense or too covered 
but really the sound that matches the open ringing sound of the instrument. Okay. Um, sometimes to achieve that sound, I use uh, not full hair of the bow. I'll use the side of the hair hmm. of the bow. Okay. Versus. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I've been thinking about doing a video on that. There is, like, when do you use full hair or when do you use the side of the hair? In the left hand, for harmonics, there are several little helpful hints. First is that even though in a normal playing position, I might put a lot of surface area on the string. For a harmonic, I find that that can mute the harmonic. So yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, when you're playing harmonics, again, I'm getting all these ideas for videos, whole other videos, watching this. Um, if you have too much flesh on the string for a harmonic, you can om it, it can be harder to distinguish that particular harmonic, especially some of these harmonics that Nick does. He's using all these kind of upper partial harmonics throughout the piece, so just being a little more precise. Instead, to have a very small contact point yes. right in the center small of the contact harmonic point. or of the node. And then release it so that it can resonate. Ah, so really the two sick. tricks are not too much surface area on the string and let the note release immediately. This is particularly clear with pizzicato. It can ring so freely. Yeah, that's stay. a good point. I don't think about that enough. Yeah, you want to you wanna let it go and then let... If you keep the finger on, it's gonna immediately dampen it. You let it go, and then it rings. Cool. On the string, mutes the pizzicato, especially if I have too much surface area covering the string. So, very small contact point, and immediate release. Awesome. Okay? Um, sometimes we do the same hand to play the harmonic, and also pluck the harmonic. Yeah, that's a cool thing. He does that when I see him play it. It's called, we call these harp harmonics. I don't know that it's actually written in the piece, but he does the end of the piece. This really cool, like, uh... I think he does it like... Kind of like that. Anyway, I'm doing a terrible job of it, but it's a really cool technique. I'm not very good at it. It's called harp harmonics. So put the thumb on the harmonic and pluck with the same hand. That can happen. It's really cool. Anywhere that there's a harmonic. One note about geography. Um, the third, the, the third of each string, so in the case of the D string, above the F sharp, there's a F sharp harmonic. That F sharp harmonic is also over the B. Yep. It's also over the F sharp. Yep. And over and? this F sharp. Yep. It divides the string into fifths. So you'll see that that harmonic is sometimes used in different locations. Sometimes yeah, it's it can be used. bewildering at first when you're working on this, but it's so cool. And and part of it is the detective work of figuring out where the best spot is for that on the bass. Just uh, in block position. Um, another harmonic is dividing the string into equal sixths. That gives the fifth, which is two octaves and a fifth above the open string. So in the case of the... Yeah, this, this piece is like a master class in harmonics. It's, it's, in fact, I created this worksheet for myself. I'll probably make a video out of it at some point just to practice all these different harmonics because he, this piece is just all about finding all these really cool uh, double stops, sort of simulating chords, right? We're only playing two notes for these, but just the, the uh, this piece really opened my eyes to what you can do harmonically in these different positions. It's just absolutely fascinating. And that worksheet I put together really helped me a lot with this, because this is way out of my wheelhouse when I started at it. He's so clear the way he explains this. I was interested this. when I wrote this piece at the same divisions of the string length like that. And there's a few moments where I, yeah, I use 
those divisions um, in my left hand. Yeah, and this piece is a master class in low thumb position too, by the way. And you may notice I'm sitting right now. Part of that's just for the camera and the computer so I don't get a neck ache. But you also probably noticed I was sitting on the recording and just practically speaking, all this low thumb position stuff, I've been practicing this piece standing for years and there's just there's just a stability that comes with sitting and doing this piece. And actually, I've been sitting, I sit when I sub with the San Francisco Symphony, so I like to practice the way that I play for the symphony when I'm doing a symphony week inside. I just found myself sitting more recently. And there are advantages to sitting, advantages to standing. I will link up to a video, I will try to remember to do that, about standing and sitting and their various advantages that I did a few months ago. A note about double stops. Double stops are always a tricky thing because we have two notes that have to. Yeah, and it's a double stop. So this is this piece is a, it's like a graduate degree in double stops and harmonics and then just resonance of the bass. It, this piece took my playing to another level and it took my conception of what you could do on the bass to another level, which sounds like kind of a grandiose thing to say, but it's totally true. This really changed my way of thinking about just how the bass rings, this piece. And I'm just so glad that he put this together in particular because you're just staring at the page or you're watching his performance and this just gives so much context to uh, how he conceived of this piece. In the case of a closed double stop, if it's out of tune, it's not always apparent which note needs to be adjusted. Um, in the case of this piece, there are only a few times where both notes are closed notes. Yeah, almost Most not. of the time, one of the notes is closed and the other is a harmonic. Isn't that cool? So in that case, we always have to adjust the closed note to the harmonic. Right, I, can tell, I can't tell you how many hours I spent doing this. But I'll tell you also, that has been tremendous for my low position intonation because there's no ambiguity. It's gonna ring or it's gonna be foul. It's just a great way to practice your your uh, your tone, your stability, your intonation, your resonance. Awesome. One thing that helps with double stops a lot is knowing which note to favor with the bow weight, mm. speed, and placement. Yeah. And what I've found is true is that always the longer heavier string needs to have the bow weight, speed, and placement. Okay, so that, so so like for that, we're, po we're focusing on the A string then. Longer, heavier string. So for example, in the opening chord, I need to find the right weight, speed, and placement for the C. And all I need to do is just adjust the bow plane so, enough so focus to pick up on the, C. the E harmonic next door. Yeah. I don't need to add any additional weight or slow the bow speed. If I do it in the opposite way, if I find the weight and speed for the harmonic and I try to bring the C in, it tends to crush. Yep. So that's sort of an immutable law of string playing fit. <laughs> I like that. Um, by the way, I have taught these opening chords. And look, I'm playing them too fast even as I'm doing the demo. There we go. I've taught this to so many students. Just those opening chords, and you can see like their their eyes light up. And so, even if this piece seems like super intimidating, which that would be a fair <laughs> thing to think for a lot of folks, probably. But just try that. Try what Nick's showing. Try the four chord or the open. You know, there we go. Five. And you'd be amazed what just these three chords. First of all, how challenging it can be to get those to really sound good and what it'll do to your playing if you can't get them sounding good. Physics, in my experience. What that means is that we always have to favor the lower note and to play the sound that works well with the lower note. 
Yeah. However, often our ear wants to hear the melody of the upper note. So there's a tendency to want to lean into... Yeah, sounds like my early attempts. Note, but it doesn't sound very good. So even... Even in those cases, I have to keep my bow weight on the lower note. Yep. One trick for giving the illusion that the upper note was stressed is to release the lower note sooner. Oh, cool. Oh, that's so a great, the, that's a great, I never even thought about that for that. Yeah. In the opening, I do a little rolling. Yeah. You're not sitting on them both exactly the same. You see? Yeah. Rather than keeping these notes, I release the lower and give the illusion of legato. The illusion of legato. I love that. Um, lengthening the harmonic. I love that. And I think the ear tends to retrospectively hear that the higher harmonic was more important. See if that works for you here. It's wild. Let's see. Um... All right, I'm thinking about that when I practice later today. He's so musical. So, Maybe this is uh, obvious, but he's so musical with the way he plays this. And that's one thing that I found, I, I get so obsessed with this piece with executing it technically, as perfectly as I can. And I, I realize that it's it all comes together when I focus on being as expressive as possible with these phrases. So that opening, I've sit, sat here for so long, like trying to get it perfect intonation wise and, and I find that if I just focus on actually making a phrase like I I, I listen back to the recording and I just enjoy it so much more. Again, I'm often using the side of the hair so that I don't have too much contact point on the harmonic. If we think about it, I'm playing this C and this note is a D natural located there. So essentially I'm playing a string length that's only that long yeah. against a string length that's this long. Right. So it's quite a bit of difference there. So I'll set up a nice primary sound on that C and then just a string next door. Avoiding the tendency to yeah. slow the bow and press. Just keep the, bow the tendency. On the lower string. There's another Entire video on that topic too. To. Nick, you're giving me great video ideas. Cool, so that one and the actual performance are available for free to anybody. And then if you're a member of String Virtuoso, which they have given me a membership to do these uh, these reviews. So thank you, uh, String Virtuoso team. You can go through the whole thing. So here's part two. Sometimes the lower, longer note is on the higher string. So for example, if I play an open G, play this D harmonic. Ah, oh, I gotta focus on the G. The D only has a string length of this, but the G has a string length of that. So my bow needs Lower, to Lower, longer note. The G string, even though it's the higher string, it's the lower pitch. Yeah, it can be a weird thing so to that's think about. important when playing passages like these thirds in maybe measure 30. For example, here I have an A natural, and this is a fingered F sharp, but it comes out as C sharp. So if I were to play them, my bass is slightly out of tune with him. Here, Sorry. you'd see that the C sharp string length is only that, and the A string length is this. So the higher string gets the bow weight, speed, and placement. Don't hesitate to play vibrato on some of these notes. Very nice to add vibrato. It's cool. I haven't done that. I'm going to experiment with that. A note about tuning to harmonics and open strings. 
Sometimes the same pitch can have two different intonations depending on which note it's tuned to. Yep. For example, if I play this B natural here against an E, it's going to have that intonation. But if I keep the same intonation against my open G, it's too sharp, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that. And this is the sort of thing that you start playing around with this and working on this piece and it really just kind of fine tunes your ear. So just, just add, again, as just a technical exercise, this piece is awesome. And then I just think it's an awesome piece of music as well. If I put that next to the E harmonic, you'll see it's too flat. So in some of the passages, I have to be careful. And this is... Uh, eloquently explained in Molly Sharp's book on just intonation. I did an entire video about that. People seem to love that. I will link up to that as well. So if you want to go down the rabbit hole in a really cool way, uh, check that video out. Which notes I'm tuning the intonation to. Here's another example. The location of this C this E is going to be different than when I play it against the D. So the same note, C natural, is going to find two different intonations. Yeah. Okay. It's awesome. Last thing I'll talk about is chops. Chop is a, a term that's used in fiddle music often. I notice that fiddle players do very small and micro movements and do really groovy rhythms. Yeah, he's so groovy so with I, this. I, I think that sometimes the word chop can give us the impression that it's a very strong and aggressive movement. Yeah, I'm probably doing it, it too much. It doesn't need to be. It can be quite small. Isn't that cool? It can even... It's awesome. In one iteration, it's a... Oh, he's going like down. Actual scrubbing of the hair I gotta straight practice towards that. the bridge. Underhand bow can just Woo. turn the bow, overhand bow, can be with the fingers. It's got such a bright quality but to it, it I love it. it doesn't need to be so, so much noise. It can actually just be a little dead note, a little... It's cool. Even yeah. simply setting the like bow on the string can be enough. Sledge I find it, it sounds a little better if I don't hit it too hard. Yeah. So another thing about that is you can release the left hand to make a dead note. So I'm, I'm neither pushing it down nor letting it up. I'm not playing ah, I practice that. It's just sort of a muted string. Things I love that I'm bad at. And then by pressing at. and releasing the left hand. I'm gonna work on it. It's so groovy. You know what this reminds me of? is Olivier Babaz's wonderful course on Discover Double Bass. I'll drop a link to that as well. I have learned so much and have, have used some of these techniques with my students as well. So if you want to learn more about that, boy, I'm, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of links in this video, but that's okay. Uh, check out that. It's just such a cool jazz bowing and, and just techniques you might not have thought of, of course. And Olivia does a great job of breaking these down. Play around with your own grooves. And if you'd like to at letter E, I encourage you to keep a groove happening on the half notes at that chop section, at least for those first eight bars or so. Nice. Okay, that's the introduction. Let's get to work looking at the piece. Okay, let's do that, and I am going to go get some lunch at the food trucks with William. William, want to get some lunch? Let's go get some lunch, baby! So we will be back in a jiffy. Lunch. That was awesome. William and I both enjoyed that, and let's dive into the piece. I like that. See, that's something I need to do. I, it's marked in the part. He takes a. He does a down, and then he does another. 
I've just gotten into the habit of doing up bow. I even marked up bow in my part, but there's this final quality to that that I like. The elegance of his bow strokes. It's amazing. He has this freedom in his bow arm, or really in his playing in general. <laughs> okay, so you'll notice I do a little rolling through the chords and keep the upper harmonics ringing. Straight. Yeah, I gotta think about that. A little bit more of an elegant approach. That's maybe a little too much, but. Yeah, yeah, it's, there's this level of sophistication that that brings to it. It's cool. So then. They're connected. Oh. Um, with the more rolled chords, you can just roll right through them. Yeah, I noticed that. I, I, I think on the recording, I held the top of... I think I held the double stop, but I... I like getting off of that and letting the top note, just kind of like an elegant roll. I like to hold the upper two together. Just to, he does a little. It can be pretty, yeah. but also a little bit more revealing about intonation. <laughs> yep. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, he's doing that throughout. Double stops and then like move into the but next one. Another little trick is to just let that part flow. Yeah. Maybe it'd be easier to begin like that and later to add more. That's the approach I've been taking. Oh, I can't And then to get this E, I, I try to remind myself that E and that E are there, so just to try to hear the E. That's kind of my, been my trick for trying to get that in tune. Sustain notes through the chords. Okay, looking at the next section, I have the same melody, except instead of a one, four, five, one chord progression, begin the first of a series of reharms. But it's the same melody, E, A, D, E. So here, I tend to finger this differently than is written in the edition. Oh, it's fascinating. I can't wait to check that out. So yeah, so this is the first point of like boggling your mind with challenge. If you haven't done this sort of stuff, this, and then, and then this, and then this super crunchy one, which just, uh, uh, the frustration level I had started to learn that took took a lot. And it, like I, I was saying earlier, if I really focus on the musical line, I find that the technical details, once I got them in my fingers, which was not a, a small task, they sort of took care of themselves. If I treat it like an etude, it sounds like an etude and not good because of the way I'm playing it, not the way it's written. It's wonderful. If I think of a musical line, that tends to tie together. Can't wait to see what he talks about in terms of the fingerings, though. Let me see this. Okay. Okay, that's what I do, I think. And he's letting one of those notes go too, like he was talking about. The only trick that I'll say to that is that if I use the open G right here, be sure to mute the open G when I play the G sharp. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. That yeah, I gotta, I gotta think about that. Not to be too cloudy. Well, my, my, my strings also, because they die so much faster, it's less of an issue than on these extremely ringy strings that Nick has. G and a G. Can kind 
kind of ring all together and yeah. be cloudy. Cloudy, it's a good one. Faster. Word. Notice that I'll do a little rolling here in the bow as I go across. Interesting. So I, the fingering that I have come up with is um. Whoops. And then I've been playing that there, and then and then it's just all in position. So just a little. That's what I do. Oh, he does it there. I found this to be to be easier here. And then that's right there. Oh. Oh, that's cool. I like that. So G and pretty sound. This is more, feels more stable. Here I'll probably mute the G and stop it ringing because again, playing the G and the C. And these are issues, especially with these strings on Nick's bass. Too many uh, pitches to too much sonic information to balance in the bass. thing that I think is useful to share here is that the intonation, the dis distance from this F and D. So isn't this a great way to learn a piece like this? You're hearing from the composer himself, you're seeing the fingerings, and, he, and again, Nick is just so well spoken with all this. You can just see he plays and he's just thinking about it, and it's just it's just great. I he Nick and I were on the ISB board together, and I had such a great time collaborating with him, and I look forward to our next adventures together. And he, he uh, you could see our, the differences in our personalities. He's just this thoughtful, well-spoken, well-considered guy, and I am sounding like I've had way too much caffeine or possibly cocaine on these videos. No cocaine. The second bar of D, and this F sharp and E is practically the same distance. So once I feel this comfortably in the hand. Oh, wild. Okay. I can move it to both locations. That's useful. And then. Oh, yeah, interesting. The fourth and fifth bars of B have the melody more or less in the bass line, except it goes to A. So I like to bring out the bass voice there. Should we look at the chop section? In four, Jason Heath. I don't know how I learned it wrong. I love all the extra stuff. I gotta practice that. I can't even begin to do that. So I like to keep that groove going through that section, but it's not necessary. It's more like how I play it. It's what's on the page, but... It doesn't need to be a big... Yeah, I, I, I thwack it too much. Ooh, I like that. Such anyway. a fun, such a fun passage to play. Uh, one, two, three. Oh yeah, what the? Okay, wow, I just totally learned this wrong. There's the dryer, by the way. Don't do your laundry and film a YouTube video, but apparently I do. One, two. Okay, Jason, practice, practice, practice. Learn it right. On the bass, it doesn't have to even be the chord I just played. Yeah, and I think I've learned that rhythm wrong. Or he's hey, playing it a little different. Oh, whatever. Fun cool. kind of jazz bebop language here. Yep. <laughs> I love all these little boom, 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 boom. Memorize. 
analyzing this was a pain in the neck. <laughs> so cool though. So the trick here is going to be to let yeah. the notes ring. That's something I didn't the left do enough. Hand off as soon as I pluck them. To not have too much surface area on the string, but only be right in the middle of the node. And then also choose my plucking location. I find that if I'm plucking these harmonics too much in the soft part of the string, it tends to be very thumpy. If I pluck down low, up here or right here, here I get the most zing without That's making cool. bass impact on the bridge. But sometimes it feels impractical to yeah yeah could jump I do that from place to place. So my solution is to bring my finger down here, really near the end of the fingerboard, and pluck. Mm, that's what I do. Oh. Hopefully not too much inside the rosin, but maybe even a little bit inside the rosin. Try not to get a Stick any finger. sweat or finger juices on where my bow's going. Yeah, that's gonna. But I really find that I can get a really pretty and buoyant pizzicato sound um, if I use those three things: pretty and buoyant. small surface nice. area, release, and plucking at a little tight, a tighter part of the string so it's not so soft and loose under the hand. Now I'll play for you the section at J. Steady pop groove. It feels so nice in this tempo. Jason Heath, slow this piece down. my notes are going to die, but if I approach the pits like he does, it'll probably help. Aren't these great harmonies? Okay. The only thing that I've done so far in this section is to play this rolling thumb pizzicato in measure 104. Yeah, regardless of how you do it, I'm trying to get this to ring. So fun. Feels like a strum on a guitar instead of only one finger or even two fingers. All that. Ooh. Three fingers straight awesome. across the strings. More things to think about when I'm practicing this. Cool. so I like to open up for the low C, but there's no need to. Harp Homerax. <sighs> I like to use those harp harmonics at the end because they're so beautiful all the strings ringing yeah when i do my normal pizzicato i have a tendency to fall on to the, yeah. the string behind so 
friends to, all right. to mute all the other strings. Start practicing that. Of course, I can have wherewithal. Yeah, it sounds just so cool with the harmonics, though. To pull away. And I love string, that. Up. But um, this. are comfortable for me so that's how I choose to do that they're also really fun um, and the only trick on the last note is plucking the D and sliding <laughs> right from the nut yeah, yeah, yeah. if you don't you'll, you'll mute it if I yep. try to catch anywhere above the nut I'll just dampen yep. the string but if I really wow. if I really catch the vibrating harmonic play with them that way. So here Especially I just with a string. take a D and then I shorten the string length. So now it's the length of an E. So another way to do that would be to play the D here by putting my thumb on the D harmonic. And then if I play an A, I'll have just shortened the string length by a whole step. So I bring this thumb up to here. I like that. That's fun. Thing. False harmonic that way. God, what a cool piece. If you like this one, I will link up to another String Virtuoso tutorial walkthrough I did with the fabulous Phoebe Russell. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.